It's Sunday, June 25, 2023. I'm Anthony Davis, and welcome to The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Joining us today is a veteran, uh, an investigator, a comedian, host of the Daily Beans podcast, and infamous, as Muller, she wrote on Twitter, Dr. Alison Gill. Welcome back to The Weekend Show. Oh, thanks, Anthony. It's great to be here. Was that enough of an introduction? I, I never really know where to, where to go because you have so much to offer. And uh, so it's, it's great that you're able to come back on the show. Um, Russia, your area of expertise is kind of really kind of explaining in, in clear language what the whole uh, kind of Russia investigation meant and how, you know, just make it easier f- for people like me to digest. It doesn't seem to go away, though, does it? And And this week has been even more powerful. It's been a bad week for Republicans. They've been uh, pining for some action or evidence out of the Justice Department that could uh, support conspiratorial claims they've made about their political foes. Um, On Tuesday, reports emerged that Joe Biden's son Hunter is going to avoid jail time. Um, uh, There was Republicans trying to stick baseless allegations against a corrupt Biden family. And then on Wednesday, the House hearing with former special counsel John Durham, who investigated the Department of Justice's Trump-Russia investigation brought even more insanity from the right. Just explain to people why Trump brought John Durham in and what he was hoping to happen off the back of the Durham investigation. Well, something that we um, might have learned that was new in that Durham testimony this week was that Durham was actually brought in three days after the Mueller report was handed over to Barr. And Durham was part of the spin that was going to happen on what came out or what was about to come out in the Mueller report. Mueller handed it in on a Friday. And then over the weekend, uh, Bill Barr had his Office of Legal Counsel whip up a memo saying that presidents can't obstruct justice and you can't obstruct justice if there's no underlying crime. And even if he wasn't the president, we wouldn't charge him with obstruction of justice. And then two days later, in comes Durham into Barr's office to meet and, you know, talk about what they think the Mueller report said. And we know that uh, Bill Barr put out that four page memo of what he considered to be the findings of the Mueller report, leaving out, you know, quotes like misquoting it so much so that Mueller actually picked up the phone to call him a couple times and actually went to paper by writing a letter disputing Barr's findings. And then for the next three weeks, he would sit on that report heavily and inappropriately redact it to curtail the depth and breadth of Russian interference, which was later determined by a federal judge. That's not just my opinion. So those redaction bars had to come off because they said he inappropriately redacted it and told America that there was no collusion for three weeks until the report came out. And as you know, my job was to go through the report and tell you what was actually in it. Uh, But that is what's kicked off this whole Durham being involved thing. He was part of the uh, the op, for lack of a better word, uh, to to bury the the real findings of the Mueller report. There's a lot of projection from MAGA Republicans and Trump kind of claiming that that, you know, the DOJ is being run as like Biden's personal DOJ. And of course, that's how Trump ran it. Right. That's that was Trump's relationship with Barr. And Biden has been absolutely, in fact, you could argue Biden's gone out of his way to remain as far from from Merrick Garland as possible after appointing him. And and apparently, you know, didn't even know a lot of the stuff in terms of, you know, the Jack Smith stuff was like reading it when we were reading it. Do you think there's there's enough of that separation? I mean, why is it that Republicans cannot acknowledge or accept that Biden is not the guy who's, you know, making all of these things happen because they always go Biden's DOJ or Biden's this. And it's like, what's it got to do with Biden? Well, the reason that they can't is because it would destroy their entire narrative um, (laughs) and all of their conspiracy theories. Um, Garland came out today in a press conference and said that Weiss, who had investigated Hunter Biden for five years, was appointed by Trump to do so, uh, had, in fact, more authority than a special counsel because someone had asked, well, why didn't you make him? Did he ask you to be be a special counsel? Why didn't you make him a special counsel? He's like, first of all, he didn't ask me to be a special counsel. Second of all, he had more authority than a special counsel. As you know, a special counsel reports to me. But I told Weiss 
Um, I am not going to have anything to do with what you have all the power to make whatever charging decisions you want, whatever charging declinations you want. I will not say no to anything. I will not curtail you in any way. So he actually, the person investigating Hunter Biden, had more authority than Jack Smith does over the Donald Trump investigations. And he made that very clear, and he's always made that clear. I don't think that the the wall between Joe Biden uh, and his, you know, White House and the Department of Justice could be any taller and thicker uh, if Trump built it on the Mexico border himself. Well, if Trump had built it, you would have been able to climb <laughs> over it or bend it and get through it or go <laughs> under it. <laughs> the wind Completely would different down, types yeah. of walls. But I, I hear I hear where you're coming from. Because you could argue that these charges that, that Hunter Biden's been hit with, uh, a firearms charge for owning a firearms for 11 days, a gun for 11 days, whilst you know, filling in the form to say that he, he didn't say that he was kind of under the influence of, of drugs, and then two tax charges, which he's now repaid the tax for. These types of charges would never normally have been charged like this. It was kind of done to draw a line under under it and try and shut down this whole Hunter Biden conspiracy. Yeah, uh, I agree. And, and I think that that kind of thing sort of came through when – you know, when Durham was testifying, um, most of the Democrats were going at him hard for not telling us what crime Trump committed in Italy that he found out about and investigated that's supposed to be in his report. But what was interesting was when Matt Gates got up to ask questions, he tore into Durham, but not for the right reasons. Right. He said, you didn't go far enough. We should have Hillary and Obama and everybody, Andy McCabe and Pete Strzok in Guantanamo right now. And you're part of the deep state op and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's just how they're going to spin this. And there's no just like Dr. Hotez and RFK Jr. There's no debating people like that who just refuse to look at the facts. So, I mean, it's 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 where we are. We just have to keep pushing back with the truth, which is why shows like yours are so valuable. Durham wasn't extreme enough for them, was he? I mean, this is the problem. He he was a kind of a moderate Republican who was, you know, had a Republican bias. But what Matt Gates was looking for, because Matt Gates practically, what was that? What was that like comparison that Matt Gates gave? Something to do with the the uh, team that always plays to lose or something. You oh, know, the Washington like, Generals. The Washington, that play the yeah, Harlem Washington Globetrotters. Generals. I mean, like it blew my mind that he was saying that stuff out loud. That, that he was prepared to say in front of this committee that you basically didn't do what we charged you with, what Donald Trump wanted you to do, which was to prove that the Mueller report was garbage and to exonerate Donald Trump. Durham couldn't do that because Mueller hadn't done that. And, and, and you know, people forget that the Mueller report basically would have charged Donald Trump with conspiracy, but couldn't because he was the president. Well, that and they couldn't really get enough evidence for conspiracy because, at least for Trump, they could for Manafort, but because of obstruction uh, from from the other players. But I, I would actually push back a little and say Durham was extreme enough for them. But there are other guardrails in our system of justice that prevent the weaponization of the Department of Justice in instances like these. We know Durham got a court or he went to the court to try to get uh, the private um, communications of a guy named Bernard and the court turned him down twice. And so he circumvented a court order to go to the grand jury to get those subpoenas. So that's pretty extreme. And also, um, it, you know, it was the when we talk about going far enough, uh, it's the grand jury that wouldn't indict any of these folks. I, I'm surprised he got a grand jury to indict Sussman, who was acquitted, and Danchenko, who was acquitted. I mean, he's got Z zero for, you know, zero for two um, in his, and, and Mueller was 37 for 37. So it's it's just stunning that Matt Gates and Republicans would say he didn't go far enough when he actually well overstepped his boundaries, hung out and drank scotch with Bill Barr all the time, took trips to Italy on our dime, but because he wasn't made a special counsel yet, uh, he doesn't have to report those costs, those taxpayer costs. So, But, of course, Matt Gates and Republicans want us to think he didn't go far enough when actually he went way out of bounds. The former AG, Bill Barr, he's a bit of a snake, isn't he? I mean, <laughs> you must be... You must be... It must incense you when you see him going on TV as he does at the moment. And taking this kind of moral high ground and giving the impression, oh, and you know, he's trying saying that Trump is toast and all this stuff. 
But but he was in the room where it happened. I mean, Bill Barr was, to all intents and purposes, Donald Trump's personal lawyer. Yeah, um, but he didn't go as far as, I guess, Roy Cohn would have gone. And so Trump disowned him. And then, of course, when January 6th happened, you know, uh, you know, Bill Barr was resigning. He's like, I'm not going to have any part of this election fraud BS is what he, he, he you know, to, to coin his phrase. Because he knew what was happening. He knew exactly yeah. what they were about to do. Yeah. And he didn't want to have any part. But if Bill Barr isn't crooked enough to be part of your scheme, you probably should rethink your scheme. Yeah. It, is this like a is this like an American political tactic where you can you can like break the law, like have no moral compass and then just wait a few months, go quiet, write a book, then get on television, rewrite history and be and have the media. I mean, the media are clamoring for interviews with him and they're not asking him any of the questions that you and I would ask him. And yet and yet he's now become like a darling of of the of the news organizations. Yeah, that's his rehab tour. Um, Mike Sherwin is on a media rehab tour as well. We saw it in the the piece that came out earlier this week from The Washington Post, where now everyone's blaming Garland for slow walking the investigation when it was Trump holdovers like Mike Sherwin, the guy who, you know, handed over documents to Flynn in his case and, you know, approved his, you know, commutation and. Uh, dismissing his case and helping Stone and all those other so guys like that and Dan Tuono, who Jim Jordan spent time praising during the Durham hearing this week, those were the those were the guys who were shutting this down and wouldn't allow for subpoenas and didn't tell Merrick Garland that there was uh you know reason to open an investigation into the leaders of the coup and that they should just focus on the boots on the ground and stuff like that and and every you know everyone's blaming Garland and and possibly rightfully so I mean it took eight months to get the new U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia in there. But a lot of that had to do with Republicans in the Senate uh, delaying those appointments. But to 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 put the focus on on Garland when it was these Trump holdovers. And we all knew as soon as we switched administrations, we were going to have to clean house because of these Trump holdovers that would damage and try to do damage uh, on investigations into January 6th. So I'm I'm not really surprised that the media is is taking part in these rehab tours for folks like Bill Barr and Mike Sherwin and Dan Tuono. But here we are. Um, So, and again, another reason your work is so valuable. Is Merrick Garland on the right side of history? You know, with with now we've discovered that there was a year's delay in in kind of really getting into this investigation. I mean, is is he going to, obviously we don't know the outcome yet. We haven't even heard Jack Smith's um, kind of indictment on the, on the insurrection itself, he's still focusing on espionage, as you do. But is Garland going to come out of this smelling of roses or of something else? Um, it depends um, on things that have yet to happen. Um, but we are where we are now with Jack Smith, um, who's moving full steam ahead. But most of what Jack Smith is doing now would not be possible without the work that the DOJ did under Garland. But we have to remember a lot of the things that happened as soon as the new D.C. attorney, U.S. attorney got there, Graves, in November, and the NATSEC assistant attorney general named Olson, who got there a few days later. That's November of 2021. That, you know, that whole delay there was from March to November, about eight months before they opened an investigation. Once they got there, they put Wyndham in charge and said, let's go. Let's investigate the top of the coup. Let's do this. And it was still Dan Tuono and the FBI who were refusing to do subpoenas and refusing to issue search warrants for Wyndham looking into the fraudulent elector scheme uh, and the, the Willard Hotel. And so much so that he had Wyndham had to go around the FBI. And that's why. Remember, we were asking, like, why is the inspector general seizing Jeffrey Clark's phone and Eastman's phone and Scott yeah. Perry's phone? Yeah. It was because the FBI was not playing ball. Now, I ask, why didn't that go up to Merrick Garland and have Merrick Garland step in and say, stop this, you know, shenan- stop these shenanigans. Let's investigate. And all of my friends who work for the FBI in top level positions have said those things generally don't go up to the attorney general. They go up to the U.S. attorney and they figured it out. But that eight months before is in question. And it's it's I think it's right to wonder why uh, Merrick Garland was so separated from that. But you also have to remember all of that information was kept from him by Trump holdovers. So it wasn't exactly the easiest thing to figure out for Merrick Garland. I think 
you know, we the public tend to kind of blame the person at the top, right? You know, in the case of all of this controversy or Biden this, Biden that. But actually, as you say, stuff doesn't really get as high as that office. And in the Attorney General's office, it's called the Attorney General's office, but there's a whole bunch of people below the Attorney General who are actually doing the work. Right. And I I think that that's why um, independent journalism is so important. We can get in there. We can talk about why these things are delayed. Um, I've been talking about it for a very long time. But also, it's important to understand um, because, you know, when Mueller was first appointed, we were like, he's going to save us. He's going to save the country. Everything is going to be great. But as time went on and we started to realize that we can't put all of our faith in one person and that we still actually have to vote and judges still have to judge and juries still have to jury and all of these, you know, guardrails of democracy have to stay in place and our institutions still have to stand that now that we're here I'm very surprised that the public is still like, well, Garland could have saved democracy, but now we're just in the now we're it's gone. We're, it, it was his job to save us all. And, and that's over. It's just too late. Uh, I'm I'm a little surprised by that. It seems actually like a right wing talking point to get us to not vote. That's just my yeah. two cents. The uh, a right wing uh, so-called journalist, um, Miranda Devine, posted on Twitter yesterday or a couple of days ago said the Biden administration knew the Titan submarine imploded on Sunday, but waited until Wednesday to make it public. Convenient smokescreen for today's House Ways and Means release of IRS whistleblower testimony of DOJ sabotage of the Hunter Biden investigation. I mean, not only is that is that just an outright lie, it is proof as to how difficult it's ever going to be to bring this country together when journalists are are putting out this type of propaganda. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that for a second as much as I don't want to like talk about the submersible, but the Navy heard yeah. it and then you have to go and verify it visually. And that's what the U.S. Coast Guard did. And it did take a couple yeah. of days. You don't want to come out and say, we heard it explode and have right. it not have been the thing that exploded. But blaming Biden, saying it was <laughs> Biden that knew, like Biden's like part of the, the Navy, Biden's on the ship, Biden finds it. Like, there's nothing to do with Biden. Well, that and the whistleblowers, right? I mean, let's take a look at the history of Jim Jordan Weaponization Committee whistleblowers. Yeah. Half of them were fired or suspended from the FBI. They lost their clearance for leaking classified or sensitive information. They all got jobs and cash from Cash Patel and uh, Meadows-backed nonprofit organizations that took millions of dollars from Trump's Save America PAC. Like, the credibility of the whistleblowers is, is, is ridiculous. And Merrick Garland today shot down those IRS whistleblowers. By, because they're coming out and saying that they that they wanted to invest. Weiss wanted to investigate more. He wanted to be a special counsel, but the but the somebody did they the deep state didn't didn't let them. Garland shut them down, and Garland's like, no man. And Weiss himself wrote a letter to Congress saying, I was in control of this whole thing the whole time. Garland never shut me down on anything. Have a nice day. So it's it's all propaganda. It's all ridiculous. It's all to make us think that our institutions are betraying us. And I think uh, I think um, well-read listeners uh, would know that. I want to talk about the uh, censure of Adam Schiff in just a sec. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsor and then back with more from Dr. Alison Gill. We've all heard the famous line, try it free for 30 days. Yeah, well, that's just enough time to try it, and then you completely forget about it. In fact, over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about. You could be wasting money and not even realizing it. Rocket Money helps you find those forgotten subscriptions so you can stop paying for ones you don't use. Do you know how much your subscriptions really cost? Most Americans think they spend around $80 a month on subscriptions, but the actual total is closer to $200. If you don't know exactly how much you're spending every month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over 80% of people have subscriptions they forgot about, and chances are you're one of them. Like that Stars app just to watch one show, or that free gaming trial you never actually used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you. And for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel, and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. 
Rocket Money also helps you manage all of your finances in one place and automatically categorizes your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving an average person up to $720 per year. Stop throwing your money away, cancel unwanted subscriptions, and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash weekend. That's rocketmoney.com slash weekend. Breathe some life into your own backyard with fastgrowingtrees.com this spring. From shade to fresh fruit to privacy and natural beauty, let fastgrowingtrees.com help you plant your dream garden with their expert advice and fast, reliable shipping. Fastgrowingtrees.com's plant experts curate thousands of easy-to-grow plant, shrub, and tree varieties for your unique climate. May are lemons to evergreens and everything in between. Happy plants, happy home, right? But sometimes it's hard to know which plants will do best. No problem, because with FastGrowingTrees.com, you get customized recommendations based on your specific needs. Plus, their plant experts are always available to help keep your plants growing healthy through the season and beyond. No more waiting in long lines and hauling heavy plants around. With FastGrowingTrees.com, you order online and your plants arrive at your door in just a few days. I love fast growing trees because I found the Alberta peach tree I was looking for at a great price, and you will too. And with fast growing trees 30 day alive and thrive guarantee, you know everything will look great fresh out of the box. Join over 1.5 million happy fast growing trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash weekend show to get 15% off your entire order. Get 15% off at fastgrowingtrees.com slash weekend it's the weekend show i'm anthony davis this is uh, dr alison gill and we are looking at uh, russia which never seems to go away adam schiff and i'm saying that in a good way R R russia should never go away right because russia is still a major advers uh, adversary russia is still meddling in elections i'm sure it has a plan for 2024 i mean this is a whole this is it's never going to disappear under the rug as Donald Trump would like. But the Republicans in, in Congress were have censured, or they, they brought about a vote to censure uh, Adam Schiff, who's, um, I think he's, isn't he, uh, isn't he, a, yeah, he's, I think he might even be my um, local uh, lawmaker here in California. Um, I think I might have driven past his office a couple of times on the way to Ralph's. That's, that's as close as I've ever got to Adam Schiff. But, uh, you know, he was just doing his job, wasn't he? And because he's a, you know, he has a trade as a lawyer, he's particularly good at doing closing arguments. He's pretty good at putting all the evidence out there in, in chronological order, makes it easy for people to digest. Republicans weren't having it, were they? What was this censorship really about? It's weird because they say it's about Russia because of what Durham came out with. Yeah. Um, but then they say it was because of his first impeachment, uh, leading the first impeachment of Donald Trump, which had nothing to do with Russia. So now they're trying to, I think, make their public and their base believe that the first impeachment of Donald Trump had to do with Russia. It didn't. It had to do with withholding funds from Ukraine illegally um, and, and shaking down President Zelensky. Uh, but it is absolutely stunning that the party of George Santos indicted <laughs> facing 60 years in prison. Uh, they needed his vote for this censure. Um, so I'm still interested in the third person who posted his bail, which withdrew before the names of his aunt and dad were released. But that the party of George Santos would censure Adam Schiff for an ambiguous impeachment that had nothing to do with Russia based on what Durham came out with. It's just absolutely blows my mind. The lines that they're trying to connect here, the dots that they're trying to connect, excuse me, just make no sense. But you don't have to make sense. If As long as you have a bumper sticker, as long as you have a slogan, you can repeat over and over and over and over again till it's till it becomes the truth. Uh, that's all they need. And that's what they're doing. I, I think you're right. They, they don't really care for what reason they managed to get anything over. They just want to own the libs. And Adam Schiff has been 
the kind of enemy of Trump ever since this started. And, you know, he called him Shifty Schiff and trying to create this whole narrative. And, and you know, Adam Schiff has been one of the most effective lawmakers on Capitol Hill. That's what they hate, right? Yeah. And I think they may have just shot themselves in the foot because I think that this censure will launch him into the Senate. You know, he's running for um, Dianne Feinstein's Dianne Feinstein's seat uh, in 2024. Uh, so the Republicans aren't doing themselves any favors with this with these shenanigans. Uh, they they really, really aren't. Uh, the voters have seen through it. They voted against it in 2020 that prevented a red wave. They should have gotten 50, 60 plus seats in the House. They got like, I don't know, a handful, barely Barely holding on to the majority with this George Santos, who is an indicted, uh, an indicted U.S. House of Representatives guy, but um, it's it's not going to go well for them in 2024. So it's going to be interesting to see what other plans they have up their sleeves to try to uh, stay in power. But there, there's so much infighting there at the moment. I mean, during <laughs> during this, there was that wonderful moment between Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene, who had a back to the camera calling her all sorts of names. They were they were kind of arguing about one stealing the other one's policy and therefore she was, wasn't able to fundraise over it. And, I mean, I love the fact that they didn't even seem to care that they were on camera. I mean, maybe they did it on purpose. It, it was the impeachment of Joe Biden articles <laughs> yeah. and resolution. Well, you, copied, you copied my idea to impeach Joe Biden. Mm, meh, and then called her, you know, a, a little B word. Uh, and uh, according to people who, who are familiar with the confrontation. Uh, but I don't think it was just for the cameras, because Lower, Lauren Boebert emerged angry from Speaker McCarthy's office. Speaker McCarthy is not keen on impeaching Biden right now because he doesn't want his censure of Adam Schiff to look like a farce, which it is, uh, because they they censured him for frivolously impeaching Donald Trump. So if they frivolously impeach Joe Biden, it sort of takes that argument out from under them. I don't know why that's the line for Kevin McCarthy on doing dumb stuff, but apparently it is. And so now they're very angry. I don't think they're going to get their impeachment, although McCarthy says he's not uh, opposed to impeaching him in the future as long as we do a proper investigation, which I think is what the Weaponization Committee is supposed to be doing, but they're failing at every turn as well. Durham turned up nothing. Weaponization turned up nothing. It's just like bunk investigation after bunk investigation, and it's just not going to work well for them in the next election. But isn't this the point that, that you know, you can go looking for corruption in the Democrat Party and you, you're really going to have to dig pretty deep because, you know, the I'm not saying that they're whiter than white, but um, I recognize the fact that I always refer to them in the most simplistic form as like goodies and baddies. And I'm not a Democrat and I don't get to vote here, but I believe in democracy and I believe in a functioning government and I believe in playing by the rules. And, and part of the problem is that Republicans gave up playing by the rules in 2017 and and you know, Trump threw the rule book out of the window. And so now it really is a case that it is not even on both sides and that all of the corruption and all of the lies and all of the propaganda and the and the faux outrage, which is the thing that annoys me the most. I mean, at least when Democrats get angry, it's for a real reason. <laughs> where, you know, where, whereas the Republicans have this faux outrage that runs along everything and it it... it in the long run, it's going to dilute the their actual messaging, their actual policies. I mean, I don't really know what they stand for at all anymore, other than just hating Joe Biden and hating Barack Obama and hating anything that's gone before. Well, they don't really have a platform at all. They didn't in the last election. But, um, you know, we need to... I hear a lot of folks uh, on in the Democratic Party saying, you know, we need to throw the rule book out the window and fight like fight dirty, et cetera, et cetera. And I just kind of want to remind everybody the reason that there's not a bunch of Democrats that have been indicted is because we play by the rule book. So that I think needs to be uh, although I have to tell you, you know, know, screaming be reasonable doesn't get a lot of, you know, people riled up. a lot of people want to that want to fight dirty, go low when they go low, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, but we, we have to remember that it's because we play by the rule book that we don't have a bunch of Democrats uh, facing indictment in the U.S. House of Representatives, for example. Or um, and, uh, but I do understand that we need to be creative and aggressive within the confines of the system of government and within the confines of democracy and in our institutions 
to make sure that things uh, get done. And I think that's why people are so frustrated with that eight month delay we were talking about earlier at the beginning of the January 6th probe. And it doesn't help that Joe Biden is 80. I mean, that that is not, you know, it's it's frustrating, isn't it? And I think even Joe Biden would prefer to be 60 right now, make his life a whole a whole lot easier, because that aspect is being weaponized. The idea that Republicans are claiming that he's senile and all, all this stuff, which is not based in truth. But, you know, their guy is overweight and therefore looks younger. Uh, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's it's again, it's hypocrisy at the highest levels to call Joe Biden old and senile when their number one front runner is, is Donald Trump, who I, I'm not going to make any judgments about anything. But I mean, let's you know, let's be again, be reasonable. Uh, it's just it's a hard it's a hard chant to get going um, at, at, at a rally. But we, we you know, we definitely need to understand that playing by the rules is is important. But we do need to be more aggressive, uh, like when people say they should lock Donald Trump up now and throw away the keys without due process, without finishing the investigation, without indictment. They think that in the, in, in the documents case, he should be remanded without bail. I'm, I, I can't believe I'm hearing Democrats saying we should remand people without bail for crimes they haven't been charged with. That is something that we long protested and why there's bail reform and going on in many of our uh, major cities and, and, and blue strongholds. We, we, we don't want that to happen. It's just because you don't like this particular criminal. But, you know, flip that around, put the shoe on the other foot. We need to stick with our our morals and our our values and what we believe is is good for uh, criminal defendants and due process and the rights of of those who are accused. But anyway, I could go on for a very long time. I I agree. I agree with all of that. But it's not going to stop Republicans from claiming that there was no due process. No, no. You know, they're they're going to argue this. And, you know, Trump's gone back to that old um, claim that the FBI planted evidence, <laughs> right, which he stopped saying for a while because he was probably advised by one lawyer who has since been fired or, or quit that that was not a very, very good or argument. Or as a witness. Or as a witness. <laughs> and, and, but now after that car crash interview on Fox where he admitted the crime, he's now gone back to saying that, that the evidence was planted. Yeah, and they're going to do that. Um, I don't think that that's a reason for us to... You know, them claiming that we've violated the laws and weaponized the government isn't a reason to violate the laws and weaponize the government, violate due process uh, and constitutional rights of the accused and and and, and all that. So I, I get it. And I've said for a long time, they're going to do that anyway. Um, he doesn't, you know, the, the old saying, if you don't have the facts, you know, pound the law. If you don't have the law, pound the table. Um, or if you don't have either, whatever, you know the thing. Um Fool me twice. You can't fool me twice. <laughs> Go back to a GW moment. Um, so that's it's their only defense. His only defense is to put out enough public sentiment and enough public statements to hopefully taint a jury pool to make them think so that there could be one juror that maybe gets gets hung because they believe in their heart of hearts that uh, what Donald Trump is saying is true. That's his only defense. But as crazy as that is, it could actually prevent him from being prosecuted. I mean, that's the, 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 the tragedy of the American justice system, is that, that really there's a good chance that Donald Trump, aside from being white and rich and, and you know, seeming to have luck on his side, is probably going to get away with this, in my opinion. Well, yeah. And, and your average accused criminal or indicted criminal doesn't have the money or the pulpit or the microphone to make stops at Cuban cafes to glad hand with potential jurors after your arraignment. They don't have uh, their own social media platform, which is also under criminal investigation, by the way, to put out all of these statements. Um, You know, that's something that he enjoys as a privilege because of who he is and who he was. And there's like, I don't know what else we can do about it. We can't give every uh, accused criminal in this country that kind of platform to taint juries and put their own messages out there. Uh, and I don't know that there's any recourse for him having that uh, ability. Uh, all I see is is Jack Smith uh, going forward without fear or favor and saying, you know what, if we got to do this in Florida because that's where the crimes were and if we end up with Judge Aileen Cannon, I don't care. My case is so strong that we're just going to go with the facts and see where it leads us. Um, and that's all the DOJ can do, right? That's that's the the 
the most they can do, which is where our power to vote in Democrats to appoint people like Garland that appoint Jack Smith ends. That's where our power ends and where it is now in the hands of judges and juries. It was a one in four chance of getting Eileen Cannon. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, the, the, the House always wins. I mean, how, how did this how did this happen? And, and, and how worried are you about the fact that she is a Trump appointed judge to who, to all intents and purposes, is very much in the cult of Trump? It's going to be very difficult after her smackdown by her own circuit, Court of Appeals, the 11th Circuit, it previously in this case, in the special master's case, for her to go way out on limbs. Uh, and that's especially due to the the uh, Confidential Information um, Procedures Act, which governs how classified documents cases are uh, tried. And there's just so many rules uh, and there are so many triggers that uh, allow the DOJ to appeal immediately to the 11th Circuit instead of being beholden to her maybe slow, long, drawn out appeals process calendar that she might create for people who want to overturn weird rulings. It's going to be difficult for her to do that. Uh, but it, it was she did have an advantage uh, in that Middlebrooks down there takes half of his cases from Miami. She takes half of her cases from West Palm Beach. And so she actually had a little bit more than a one in four chance of getting this. But the other judges are also extremely conservative. Uh, but again, I'm uh, a little bit relieved that this is being done under the SEPA rules and procedures because there's little she can do. I mean, there's stuff she can do, and we'll keep an eye on her. Uh, but again, this is one part of one investigation. He's looking at wire fraud. He's looking at the Save America PACs. He's investigating January 6th still. Uh, he, you know, There's so many other uh, investigations that are happening that will be brought in other venues like D.C. or Virginia that we can um, that we can look forward to. And then, of course, we got Fonnie Willis down in Georgia, who's not subject to any of that stuff. So going to be interesting to see how all of this shakes out in the coming years. But for the rest of his life, Anthony, he is going to be in and out of court accused of crimes. Um, and it's it, there are no more good days left for him. Jack Smith is very experienced. Eileen Cannon is very inexperienced. Do you think that could be the thing? Because, you know, she says this, he jumps on that. Is there a chance that this is going to be like a, a kind of cat and mouse or like a Tom and Jerry cartoon? What are we going to see in the coming weeks? Well, that's kind of the cool thing about SEPA, right? All of this stuff is going to be done under seal and ahead of trial instead of a regular criminal trial where we have the arraignment and then we have all the pre-trial briefings that are filed in the public and we have motions to dismiss and motions to limit the amount of evidence that gets allowed into. That's motion and limine. All of that stuff is going to be done ahead of time, under seal, in private, and there are going to be a lot of people in Department of Justice and the special counsel's office basically bringing Judge Cannon up to speed uh, on what it is to try a SEPA case, particularly since she only, I think, has 14 days of, of actual criminal trial experience under her belt. So this is going to be um, this is going to be the schoolhouse rock for, for Eileen Cannon uh, and. You know, I've talked to several SEPA experts. That could take months and months and months. I don't think there's going to be an August 14th trial date, just so everybody is clear. Yeah, I, I, I heard that. That was a little optimistic on on her behalf. Um, let's talk about Jack Smith offering limited immunity to at least two Republican fake electors in return for their testimonies to a grand jury over Trump's alleged efforts to overturn the, the election. Um, I mean, the, the fake electors scheme was their... This was their plan to, and in hindsight, it just seems ridiculous, but they were so convinced that it was going to work, right? Fake electors. I mean, it's like, it's just nuts. And yet, you know, it, 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 it could have worked if Pence hadn't been briefed appropriately or taken the best advice or the right advice. What, what's the deal here with Jack Smith and these electors? And, and let's just talk about them flipping. Yeah, sure. Uh, I remember last week NBC reported that these two Nevada fake electors had been seen going into the Prettyman Courthouse, which is the D.C. courthouse where the grand jury meets for the January 6th investigation uh, by the special counsel. And w what I had said at the time was like, these guys had their phones seized. These are fraudulent electors. If they're going into the grand jury to testify you generally don't bring a target of your investigation in to testify. You bring witnesses into your grand jury to testify. So I said, these guys probably flipped. 
Um, the same is true for Gary Michael Brown, who was recently brought in this week as well, um, who was part of organizing the fraudulent electors, the slates of fraudulent electors, and putting pressure on state legislatures to hand in those Trump electors, uh, even though that's completely illegal. Um, now, uh, and then we find out today from CNN, they were given offered limited immunity. So, you know, they are, that's kind of a flip, right? We're, we're going to yeah. not charge you. You tell us everything that you know. And and these guys are going to have ever, all the goods on people like Sidney Powell and Rudy Giuliani and, and that whole group. Whether it goes all the way up to Trump or not, I'm not sure. But this could be part of an investigation into someone like Eastman or Jeffrey Clark. Uh, or you Mark know, Meadows, even. Mark Meadows, the lawyers who were uh, organizing these fraudulent slate of electors like Rudy and Sidney Powell. Um, but it could go all the way up to Trump. But it, I think it's very, very important uh, that Jack Smith said, no, I'm giving you immunity and you're coming in this month. That means he wants to work fast. He's he's working fast. And it also means I think he's close to charging decisions. He's already had the big dogs in, Meadows and Pence and uh, Cassidy Hutchins, everybody. Now he's got these, oh, I flipped a couple people. Let's get their testimony in. That's like the wrap up. That's like the end of the investigation. And so we'll see. We'll see how that ends up turning turning out. But uh, we could see charges relatively soon. Do you think there's a chance that not just these fake electors, but quite a lot of people that were involved in the insurrection at multiple levels, and I include people who have been uh, prosecuted for their behaviour on the day on on the on the sixth, you know, in in terms of the riot, that they were they they were duped. You know, there's a good chance that the fake electors were told, well, you know, this is legal, this is the way it's done, and that they didn't know that they were breaking the law, that because you know, it's a very convincing argument when you think that it's been the diktat has come from the top. And, you know, a lot of the rioters were like, well, the president told us that this is what we had to do. We had to go to the Capitol and take our country back. And so, and a lot of them have admitted in their testimony that, oh, well, you know, I was just following orders. Trump made me do it. And, and if I'd have known that it was illegal, you know, it's the people's house. If I'd have known it was illegal, I probably wouldn't have done it. And a lot of them have shown regret. How much of this whole scheme, both the riot and the insurrection internally with the electors, how much of it do you think is a it's like a confidence trick to, to bring gullible or naive people in and make them do Trump's bidding? Well, well, all of it. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, when you when you when you think about it, um, we talk about um, the fact that there were two states, Nevada and Pennsylvania, where Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell at, at the behest of Trump and Eastman said, hey, we need alternate slates of electors. And there were two states, these two states, which is why it's interesting. These Nevada guys have flipped who said, we don't think that's legal, so we'll we'll put forward an alternate slate of electors, but with the caveat on this form certificate that you sent us, we want to change it a little bit to say, only use these alternate electors if the court overturns the results of the election. Yeah. Uh, and that's what they did, and that's why I think these guys are in less trouble in, in Pennsylvania, for example. Uh, but other states um, just flat out did it. Now, we know that in Georgia, eight of those electors have taken immunity and have flipped because of probably just what you said. But on the on the flip side of that, the reason that they were able to get immunity was because of threats of being charged, because it doesn't matter if you were tricked by Trump, as we've heard judge after judge sentencing the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys and uh, or not the Proud Boys. They haven't been sentenced yet, but the Oath Keepers and all the attackers of the January 6th rioters and seditionists. They've been like, dude, I, Trump and Fox News told me I was there because Trump asked me to. He's like, that doesn't excuse you breaking the law. And a George Conway used a really great example, the O.J. Simpson example. O.J. Simpson actually did go to jail, not for what, you know, he should have gone to jail for. But basically, uh, a collector had stolen a bunch of memorabilia from him and took it to a hotel room in Vegas. And O.J. busted in with a gun and stole it all back. And his defense was, it was mine. Yeah. And they go, you still can't rob somebody at gunpoint, even if they took what was yours. That is still a crime. And the same is true with an election. Uh, you, you can't attack the Capitol physically and try to obstruct the official proceeding of, of the t peaceful transfer of power and say Trump told me to do it or... It's our house or, you know, those aren't defenses. They, If they, you know, obviously if they 
admit to wrongdoing and show remorse, they'll get a little bit of a lighter sentence, but it doesn't absolve you from breaking the law in the first place. And last week, uh, I forget his first name, Rodriguez, got 12 and a half years, and he was defiant even in the courtroom, shouting, Trump won. Yeah, I guess once you're sentenced to over 10 years in a federal prison with no hope of parole, you know, you might as well uh, give that last shout out in case Trump wins the election and might pardon you. Um, That's what I think that was about. We have to take another quick pause for our sponsor, but uh, I want to come back and talk about some breaking news in these cases, which uh, I know you're very keen to tell us about. So uh, back in just a moment. Maybe you're like me and you sometimes struggle with what to wear, finding pieces that go together and the hassle maybe of changing clothes for different activities. Well, Roan's Commuter Collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products. Commuter Collection offers the world's most comfortable clothes. You never have to worry about what to wear when you have the Roan Commuter Collection. And with Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. With Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner all together. I personally love feeling fresh. I love a technical fabric, and that makes me kind of confident knowing that the, the clothes are looking after themselves. Well, the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. Head to roan.com slash weekend show and use promo code weekend show to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to roan, R-H-O-N-E dot com slash weekend show and use code weekend show. It's time to find your corner office comfort. If you have a family like I do, you'll know how much your loved ones depend on you. In a worst-case scenario, you wouldn't want them to worry about money. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 a month for $1 million worth of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and offer unnecessary medical exams. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million worth of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Policy Genius has licensed award winning agents who can help you find the best fit for your needs. They work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. Policy Genius is for parents, caregivers, and anyone else who has people who depend on them. They simplify the process of getting life insurance so you can protect the people you love. There are no added fees and your personal details are private. No wonder they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. Head to policygenius.com or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you could save. That's policygenius.com. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I was tired of taking so many supplements and wanted a single solution that supports my entire body and covers my nutritional bases every day. I wanted better gut health, a boost in energy, immune system support, and wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. I drink AG1 in the morning to start my day. It makes me feel unstoppable and ready to take on the day. And on top of it all, I'm doing something good for my body, like I'm giving my body the nutrition it craves, like I'm covering my nutritional bases. I've tried a ton of different supplements out there, but this is different, and the ingredients are super high quality. 
I got started with AG1 because I used to take all these different pills and gummies, and frankly, what I was taking was expensive, and I didn't even know if it was good for me. But with AG1, I know what I'm consuming has the best ingredients and also tastes delicious. AG1 makes it easier for you to take the highest quality supplements, period. When I started my AG1 journey very quickly, I noticed that it helps me with improved digestion, energy, and just overall feeling great. It's just one scoop of powder mixed with water once a day, making it a seamless and easy daily habit to maintain. I'm asked all the time about the one thing I do to take care of my health, and if I could pick just one, it would be foundational nutrition, and AG1 is a top foundational nutrition product. Just one daily serving gives me the comprehensive foundational nutrition I need and supports energy, focus, strength and clarity with 75 high-quality vitamins, probiotics and whole food sourced ingredients. I can't think of another daily routine that pays off as well as AG1, which is why I trust the product so much. If you're looking for a simpler, effective investment for your health, try AG1 and get five free AG1 travel packs and a free one-year supply of vitamin D with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash weekend show. That's drinkag1.com slash weekend show. We're back with Alison Gill, the InfoWars host Owen Schroyer, who promoted baseless claims of 2020 election fraud on the far-right internet platform, pleaded guilty on Friday to joining the mob of Donald Trump supporters who rioted at the U.S. Capitol. Um, tell us about this guy, Alison, and, and tell us what uh, kind of Jack Smith has, has somehow made him do. Well, he was being investigated for his attack on, on the Capitol, right? Being part of the, the January 6th um, attack on the Capitol. So it wasn't under Jack Smith's purview. It was just under uh, DOJ, D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, Matt Graves. And what had happened is there was a minute order that popped up on the docket a couple of days ago saying, uh, hear ye, I am Judge Timothy Kelly here in D.C. And uh, we're changing the um, sentencing hearing um, status update to a change of plea hearing. Uh, and I went, holy majoli, because if you're changing your plea and he also asked for any cooperation agreement, any proffer, the judge wanted all this information from the DOJ. I was like, if he's changing his plea and he's pleading to a couple of misdemeanors and having several charges dropped, that dude is cooperating. And we learned today from CNN um, or, or from, excuse me, The Hill, I believe, that that is actually uh, the case. There is a cooperation deal on the table. He is taking, he is helping, he is assisting the DOJ in, quote, another investigation in exchange for taking a plea for lesser charges. And that other investigation, dollars to donuts, is the Jack Smith investigation. Because that guy was at the Willard Hotel on uh, January 5th and January 6th with people like Alex Jones, who, who you know, he's his right-hand man, uh, Mike Flynn was there. Um, Meadows wanted to go, but Cassidy Hutchinson told him not to. Um, they, uh, who else? Roger Stone. He was in the Friends of Stone group since 2019. Um, and so if if anybody has any inside information besides Bannon and Flynn and Stone who aren't going to testify or give you any kind of relevant uh, information or evidence, if anybody could help the government find out whether there was a connection between the White House and the violence on the Capitol on January 6th, this guy is probably the one who could do it. And he's gotten a pretty good deal. So his proffer, I mean, you don't give a deal to somebody unless what they're offering you is valuable information. Which And so what that says is that what he knows is valuable to Jack Smith. And, and that I find very important and very interesting. I don't think it's getting enough coverage today. This is where Jack Smith's skill really kind of comes in, doesn't it? That that he seems to be looking at this from a very maybe it was maybe what he learned in he was at the Hague, wasn't he? He was uh, very much ensconced in in European law, and and which is kind of different. And maybe that gave him a perspective that is is different to you know traditional American justice. Yeah. And he also spent a great deal of time at the PIN, the Public Integrity Unit uh, at the Department of Justice, prosecuting people like former Governor McDonnell and, and John Edwards uh, for his campaign finance violations. He is very good at doing things quickly, saying, all right, I'm not going to mess around with you. We're not going to go back and forth. 
uh, with the grand jury judge. Look, you can have immunity or I'm going to charge you now. And then they make their decisions based on that. We saw it with Walt Nauta and the documents case. They were like, you want to you want to cooperate? It would be a really good idea for you to cooperate. And he's lied to them. And they're like, all right, you're done. And uh, oh, but 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 I was wrong. I meant this. Yeah. Yeah. We know you're still go. You're still getting charged. Um, so he, uh, you know, in this new CNN reporting, at least um, we know is working really hard to get secure the testimony of these witnesses fast. Uh, and he, he he's not playing around. And it's very it's good to see. Um, it's it's comforting as opposed to that first eight months of the of the Garland uh, tenure where nothing was happening. We can argue about why nothing was happening, but nothing was happening. This uh, this Infowars guy was um, reported as screaming that Democrats were tyrants uh, at uh, at the January six um, riot. There's a lot of bravado from these MAGA Republicans that when they're put on the stand all kind of disappears, you know. And I was thinking about Alex Jones, you know, so much of it is, is is put out there. He doesn't really care who he offends. He says anything. And then when he's up in court over his divorce, he's like, it's all an act. I didn't mean anything that I said. Uh, I just do it to make a living. I mean, this, isn't this the problem, that the, the faux outrage is the brand and everyone has bought into it to the detriment of the institution of American freedom and democracy is that, you know, none of this is, there's no point to any of this. I mean, none of it, the whole thing is a total waste of everybody's time. If Donald Trump had just conceded the election and allowed the peaceful transfer of power, he could still run again. I mean, it's like, this is it. This is the whole thing almost goes back to just one guy, one aggrieved man in, in West Palm Beach who just has never heard the word no and has thrown his toys out of the pram and 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 America has been completely burned to the ground because of one solitary individual. We're not burned to the ground yet. We can stop it. And we will stop it. I have faith in that. Um, but yeah, it 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 all boils down to him. It all boils down to him. He, if he just had given the documents back to the National Archives, we wouldn't uh, be uh, having an arraignment down in Judge Aileen Cannon's court. Uh, he, you know, as you said, his defenses for the documents case are, I could declassify them with my mind or I, they were planted or whatever. But in court, when it came down to the nuts and bolts of the case, he wouldn't say those words to the judge under penalty of perjury. His, his defense was, I, we just, they were, it was an accident. Um, he didn't use the declassification defense because he knows it's BS. He didn't use any of the planting the fbi planted and the doj tried to get him to say it too they're like if you have if this is your defense tell us and then he's like no we're not going to do that at this time it's like ah, yeah i thought so when and you're right when you get these guys facing actual charges from an aggressive prosecutor who worked at the hague and the public integrity unit jack smith they break down or they keep defying you and end up in jail donald trump's been told he's not allowed to communicate with the co-defendant. He's not allowed to look at any of the evidence anymore without uh, supervision, and he's the same for his lawyers. What are the chances, just finally, that he's not going to adhere to any of these rules and end up being prosecuted for kind of breaking the terms of, of this indictment? A hundred percent he's not going to adhere to these rules. And if there is anyone who could bear that out and find the evidence and prosecute him with it, it's Jack Smith. Uh, so we'll end up seeing what happens. But, I mean, it's very hard to police somebody not talking to their Diet Coke valet about the case in the, you know, in a walk and talk with the radio on real loud in the bathroom. Um, so, you know, we'll see what ends up happening. Uh, I'm very interested to see if he can keep uh, quiet about the evidence. We know that the witness testimony and transcripts have been handed over. Uh, now from Jack Smith as part of discovery for the unclassified part of the materials. And he is not allowed to talk about that. Um, but it's going to be very difficult for him to not lash out at the witnesses that have testified against him once he finds out who they are, which I think he now knows. And intimidate witnesses, as he did yeah. with Cassidy Hutchinson when she gave testimony at the January 6th investigation. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's going to be very, very hard. And I know that uh, Jack Smith and his team are keeping a pretty close eye 
on the very important protective order because they said in there this could this could disrupt ongoing investigations. Okay. Very final question is just a prediction. I know we don't like specialize in these, but like how's this going to play out, Alison, with the benefit of your experience? Timeline Will Trump make it to 2024? Will he be a candidate? I mean, what? how is this all going to play out, do you think? Yeah, he's a candidate. He will be a candidate. I think he might be the the nominee uh, for the Republican Party. Uh, but in a general election, being an indicted guy doesn't play well um, to independent voters, which is a large, I think the largest voting bloc. One of the, you know, it's it's pretty even with Republicans and Democrats. It's not going to play well. Um, so I, a lot of Democrats are like, great, let him be the nominee. He's going to be the easiest one to beat. Um, I think the Georgia will announce that he is indicted on racketeering charges in August. I, I'm predicting between August 7th and August 14th. I think that um, Department of Justice might announce January 6th charges. I don't know if it'll go all the way up to Trump, but I think they'll announce them before or right around the time Fonnie Willis does. And <clears throat> all other investigations will probably give way to those uh, federal investigations. But this documents case, because of the nature of the classified documents and all the stuff that has to be figured out under seal before the trial even starts, might not happen until after uh, the election. A lot of experts are telling me in SEPA, a lot of SEPA experts are telling me. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But no matter what, it doesn't take away our responsibility and our civic duty to vote. Uh, I don't want anyone to rely on Department of Justice or Fonnie Willis or Alvin Bragg or the New York Attorney General to take care of democracy for us. It is always in our hands. We end up with the government we deserve, and we have to make sure that we get out and vote in 2024, take back the House, keep the Senate, and give Joe Biden another four years to get things done. Okay. Alison Gill, thank you very much for joining us again here on The Weekend Show. Thanks for having me. I'm Anthony Davis. Subscribe to MAGA Uncovered. It's my new show with Ron Filipkowski here on the Midas Media Network. And don't forget to support me and independent journalism on patreon.com slash five minute news. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch.